our Saturday stories. I am very, very delighted to have our guest this morning, who is not just um, an illustrator of very big talent and uh, has won a Caldecott Award, two Coretta Scott, uh, King, Coretta Scott King Awards and a Seabird Honor Award uh, for her beautiful books. And um, this book is a very special book that's just been honored in our original art show for the 2023 exhibition that ran for three months at the Society of Illustrators. And her book, her illustration from the book is also selected to go to the Bologna Book Fair this year, which is very exciting. So we have Cosby A. Cabrera with us this morning, joining from Evanston in Illinois. And Cosby was born in Brooklyn to Honduran parents. And she uh, grew up and was raised in Brooklyn and went to the Parsons School of Art and Design in New York City, where she uh, graduated with a degree in fine arts. And her background is very diverse. She's done textile design. She did a lot of album cover designs for um, big music industry. Um, I guess it was back in the times when we had album covers or CD covers and they were beautiful to collect and like works of art. So she has that graphic design background as well. And she then started to do picture books and she authored um, Me and Mama, which was the book that won the Caldecott Award, which is fantastic, I believe in 2021. Um, and this book that we're featuring this morning is wonderful. It's about Chef Edna Lewis. It's written by acclaimed author Melvina Noel. And um, this is a, a beautifully illustrated book that um, Cosby will read to us um, during the program, but gorgeous, gorgeous illustrations. And um, we have uh, the pleasure of seeing how she has done her illustrations this morning with a little bit of a background presentation. She's going to talk about herself and um, her inspirations. And also she's a doll maker. She makes municas, which are um, the name for a doll in Spanish. They're beautiful and collected. Um, I believe, does Oprah Winfrey have one of these dolls? I know she's a big fan of yours. Yes. And um, I, I, I love dolls too. I, I've collected a few of these handmade dolls and I'm going to get one of Cosby's. I, I just think they're amazing. And um, she's also, well, she's got a daughter and um, her daughter is 14. And um, at the book, Me and Mama, was sort of inspired by um, her daughter. So check that book out if you haven't already got that book. I know we have fans of Cosby this morning. Welcome, welcome. And I hope you have your art materials because we're going to do some artwork during the second portion of the uh, presentation this morning. So Cosby will talk a little bit about herself and she'll read the book to us, which will be a, a real treat. And then we'll do some drawing together. And please do ask any questions that you might have for Cosby and let us know where you are from. We love to hear where you're joining from. Um, I will ask your questions on your behalf during the workshop portion. Uh, do send in your illustrations. You can email them to me behind the scenes. Tim will put in the uh, chat my email and any other information that you might need to know. He'll put that in the chat, like perhaps you might be interested in art materials. He can note those for you. And so without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you this morning, Cosby A. Cabrera. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. I appreciate that. I'm going to go share my screen. Okay, there we are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've titled this uh, Finding the Heart in Picture Bookmaking, but I think no matter what we are doing, we want to find the heart in it. But let's start off with a greeting, shall we? Um, this one comes from uh, me and Mama, um, and you can follow after me, and, and it's just... Uh, the beginning of the book where uh, she is looking for her mother. Okay, so good morning. You're going to have to help me out, Claire. Good morning. To you. To you. Good morning. Good morning. To you. To you. Good morning. Good morning, my darling, my darling. Good morning, good morning <laughs> to you, <laughs> to you. I hope you're enjoying the mama bright as sun. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> oh, that was fun. <laughs> Sometimes she sings it like the birthday song. I tiptoe to where she is in the house. 
It smells like cinnamon. Papa and Luca are still asleep, but I want to be everywhere Mama is. And so I'm wondering if you at home have somebody like that in your in your life where you just want to be everywhere they are. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, so feel free to put that in the chat. If there's somebody you just want to be everywhere they are. <laughs> and let's just move on a little bit. I just want to share um, some of my journey and my process. This is from me and Mama. You know, here she is. She's not doing the job so well. Um, and so I love it when we allow our kids to do things, even if they don't do it so well, because uh, that's how they get to practice. <laughs> and the best part of a rainy day. So this is what I've been up to, if I can share a little bit with you. So this um, making and start here of a quilt um, that I have on the wall, uh, I spent a summer residency at the uh, Illustration Institute in Peaks Island. And Peaks Island is one of the um, calendar islands uh, in the northern uh, tip of Maine. Um, and they're called the calendar islands, as uh, Tom Nash would say, uh, because there are 365 of them, which is so interesting to have 365 tiny islands. So this is Peak mm -hmm. Island. And what I did is um, I thought I was going to assemble some fabrics, you know, for the background. And what I did instead was I used the quilt, uh, rather the fitting room curtain from my shop. I had a shop where everything was custom built uh, in the shop for about a decade. And I decided to use that fitting room curtain because Patricia McKissick loved to say that cloth has a memory. And I agree with that, you know, that um, that quilt that might have been um, brought to the picnic and now it's got the strawberry jam uh, stain, you know, that couldn't quite get washed out, you know. And so this fitting room curtain, everyone who entered my shop, if they were trying something on, they would pull the curtain um, you know, back and enter and then pull it close. And so all of the stories that um, people brought me over a period of time, I felt like it's sort of imbibed in the in the cloth, you know, no matter how many times it's undergone a, a wash. And so um, this is me. <laughs> oh. I'm four here. I'm four. And at four, you wouldn't find me if you came to my house. Um, because I was so shy and more than likely I'd be hiding under the bed. Um, and this particular day I'd gotten lost. Um, and there's nothing worse for uh, than a shy person getting lost, you know. And fortunately, some police officers were kind enough to um, notice that I was without my, you know, my family. And they walked the entire length of that recreational park. Uh, to locate my family. And I was very grateful to them that day. So this is a book because we all have a favorite book growing up, I think. Um, and take note of what that is for you. For me, it was like how to make doll clothes. My mother gifted this to me when I was nine years old. And I would spend hours, you know, reading all of this like very text heavy, um, you know, book because she described how you could fold fabric in a particular way. And it had these like very simple line drawings, you know, and I would just study this, you know, because you could fold fabric and create a seam, cut it in a particular way and it would fit something three-dimensional. Even my brothers were excited because I would make clothes for their G.I. Joe dolls. <laughs> and then I went on, as Claire said, um, you know, to study communication design at Parsons School of Design. Um, and after working with a number of top drawer um, design studios in New York, as well as um, advertising agencies. I ultimately landed at pharmaceutical advertising, which I hated. And every day, because we would take incredible talent, incredible illustrators and, and photographers, and then it would just go through the marketing process where everything 
um, just we did not make the best use of the talent as it was presented to us. And so my dream was then to design for music. And I finally landed my dream job at Atlantic Records um, with a really amazing creative team. And then I moved on to Sony Music. And so I got to work with type and, you know, um, communicate in such a way and maybe perhaps even put a little swagger on a page that someone um, reading and enjoying the music rather would be able to enjoy reading the liner notes, the accompanying liner notes. Um, and then I left my dream job because I was going to all these different um, antique fairs and noticing that the black dolls that I saw um, did not move me. Um, they actually made me feel very discouraged. And I thought, oh my God, just from an anthropological point of view, if something should happen to the earth and all we could dig up as signals and signs and evidence that I or someone who looked like me or my family had existed, um, I'd be like really, really disappointed. Um, and so, because uh, a lot of the dolls were actually stereotypes. So I started to make these dolls out of linens and tissue linens uh, with hand embroidered faces. I'll just show just a, maybe a moment of this. I don't know if we have enough sound. I have a passion for really beautiful things. There are still many, many artisans crafting beautiful dolls by hand. And we recently went to Brooklyn, New York, to visit our friend Cosby Cabrera, who has a passion for bringing her dolls to life. This is one of them. Quite extraordinary, don't you agree? Cosby's handmade black dolls have drawn the attention of collectors and the American Craft Museum. Each doll is the result of hours and hours of work using a multitude of techniques from hand stitching and beading to hand painting. A lot of the black dolls that I saw were just incredibly uh, gross stereotypes. They weren't really graceful representations whatsoever. And, and I walk out of there feeling really dejected. I wanted to see dolls that were graceful representations that had beauty and, and aspect and element of beauty and character. And that's what I began to make. I do a lot of hand beading. I do a lot of hand painting on the dolls as well. You know, this is an example of a doll that has a hand painted face. And I created these little circles. Um, it's an old fashioned technique where quilts were once, um, you know, done using these little circles that are basically sewn together. And these have been hand dyed. Uh, they are unbleached muslin and I joined them together. And on top of that, you know, I did a little bit of a, a detail for beading. Each doll is different because I am engaged in the activity of play. And play is never the same. It's never repeated. It's not routine. It's different every time. What I do is I use various materials and different techniques. Uh, I'm still working with cloth uh, because there is a certain uh, beauty and honesty in fabric uh, that I love and that I continue to draw from the first doll. So um, I'm going to move on in the interest of time. And so lots of hand beaded detail. Um, and so I have a pile, you know, it's, it's really funny. One of my former employees for the shop, you know, she wanted to clean up and so she saw the bin of, you know, some of these items and she um, was trying to throw it away. And I'm like, I know this looks like trash, but it's really my treasure. You know, I've had even someone gift me a Vietnamese, uh, Viennese Taylor's um, ribbons and things that she had saved. And she had survived the Holocaust, but she had bits of ribbon and trims, you know, carefully wrapped in pieces of cardboard, you know, and they knew that I would make good use of this, you know, and I would appreciate it. Um, and so here we are, I'm just, so this series is called Dulce and they're all hand beaded crowns and lots of uh, vintage details and you've seen that. And I'll just give you a little hint of this and that's just taking the needle and thread uh, very, very simply um, and then whipping around the edge. That's why it's called a whip stitch. Um, and then uh, this, kind of slows down time in a way and feels very much like a meditation. It's like you can't help but quiet yourself when you're engaged like this. And that's why it's so good to even uh, give needle and thread to children. Yeah. Yeah, and there we are. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so this is uh, the activity of quilting. Um, and quilting is a verb. So you take the top layer, the bottom layer, and a fluffy cotton layer in the middle. Um, and you literally sew through these layers. And that's what gives it that nice sort of texture there. And that was done in silk. Beautiful. Wow. And I'm going to just move along. I, this will be the last one, I think, that I'm going to show. And so I'm just taking tiny little stitches to close up a little uh, edge of a tie here. And as I said, this is silk. We know that we dry clean silk. But in this case, I've actually, I've washed it. And these are some of the details. Mm -hmm. And the washing allows, uh, you know, for us to have that really amazing crinkled texture. And I've done it for Land of Nod, you know, Crate and Barrel. Yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so this is the old shop. Um, and so people would walk in from the neighborhood or travel, you know, to get to me and bring some friends. And it's like life on the farm. Um, so this fabric on the right, I've actually used that in that splash um, page that I'd showed you. Um, so I take the fabrics oftentimes that I've worked with and I bring them into my illustrations. You know, I refer to them to paint. And so this is me cutting um, because I did all of the design, the pattern making, the cutting, the sewing, and then eventually brought in a team to help me with the sewing in order to keep up. Yeah. Uh, this is a quinceanera dress and that little patch with the mother pro buttons, as you can see, it's a, a scrap from uh, my spring collection. And that's the same uh, embroidered fabric there. No matter your size or proportion. And I always had young people, you know, coming through who wanted to learn a, a skill. And there we are. So it's oh, kind of like uh, the dolls, but... <laughs> Um, you know, even winter coats, you know, with felted wools, um, but for humans <laughs> and children and quilting. Uh, so this uh, was showing at the Myrtle Beach Art Museum along with um, um, uh, an exhibition with the G's Ben quilts. Uh, they had a separate wing with um, my quilt. This is called Quince Brazos, which means 15 arms because they're 15 different vintage shirt sleeves pointing in different directions um, as a nod to the directional quilts for the Underground Railroad. This one's called Singing Bones, the bones that are purported to um, lie in the Atlantic Ocean that didn't quite make it through the uh, transatlantic passage. My parents' wedding quilt, ABC, still in love with typography. And what I love are community quilt projects um, where um, I will take a group of people who may not even relate to each other that are in the same community um, and give them some writing prompts and have them tell their stories that at times actually bring tears to your eyes, you know, um, and, and it's the sharing. I always say that then winds up creating a sense of intimacy that did not exist. You know, um, I call it the hush and the bond. And I have my very tall friend, Kristen, standing in front there. Um, she's like very, very tall. I wanted to get a sense of scale. I've done it for my daughter's fourth grade class. I'll share that with you here, you know, and children, um, again, you know, you can ask them what their earliest childhood memories are, and they'll say, or the memory that stings versus aches, or the memory that tickles their funny bone, you know, the memory that's been passed from generation to generation, and they come up with incredible things. Um, you know, here I am sort of tidying things up so that they don't fall apart, <laughs> and the quilt could last for a little bit. Um, yeah, it's like the wedding that I attended and, you know, I, I danced all night with my cousin, you know, just incredible memories, you know. Um, yeah, when I was in Africa and I would, you know, take my, um, my, my goats, you know, out, you know, and uh, they would eat the grass and I would eat my lunch, you know. Yeah, just incredible memories. So this is me again the verb quilting, going through these layers. And this is the final uh, piece. And they got to keep this, of course, and it's in their library as a collective memory. 
And I think we'll find my daughter here. She's much taller now, but yeah, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> and Willa. Yeah, again, this community piece where, um, you know, intergenerational. So people in their, you know, elderly in their late 80s and early 90s, you know, and even uh, young children together um, in the books, of course. And so I start off with a sketch, you know, sketch is not precious, you know, it takes very little time and effort. Um, you know, it's just like literally just capturing the thought um, and the composition about how I may want to frame it and my negative space. You know, and sometimes I'll do a color sketch. So this one, I think I might have done, yeah, in gouache. And then I go to paint and I paint using acrylics uh, typically. So this was actually in the, the uh, me and mama is in the rooted exhibit um, that's happening in the Brandywine Museum. So the home to Andrew Wyeth, one of our most treasured American painters. She turns off the light. It's like, ooh, what do we do in the dark? So in this case, she's spinning pictures <laughs> and reviewing her day. Again, pencil, you know, love to um, just capture the idea. It doesn't have to be beautifully rendered. That's not the point, you know, and then go to pain. This is where I'm sort of like prob problem solving in the sketch phase of things. peek a -boo. And here's my question. It's like for all of us in the audience, it's like where my stories come from. We are carrying stories. And at times we even take it for granted, you know, stories that even travel through, as I said, the generations. So this is me working out um, this book that's so called Exquisite. And um, I wanted to um, I wanted to find the best possible approach for her. Um, Gwendolyn Brooks is a, a poet. She didn't wear glasses until she was middle-aged, but she's always seen with eyeglasses. So I knew I wanted to include that for the sake of recognition. Um, even as I was representing her as a child, I had no pictures of her as a child. Um, and I'm not afraid to get metaphorical, as you can see here. It may not be approved or accepted, but these are the ideas that you want to kind of like home out of yourself, you know, like no matter, uh, without any thought about what they're going to like. <laughs> you know, you just want to get to the best solution. I have her looking out the window um, because she was known to have said that poetry comes out of life. And a lot of um, her neighbors inspired some of her stories. Um, and her poetry. And so I decided I was going to settle on this. As I said, I had no pictures of her as a child. Um, and so I had to reconstruct her skull. We know that when we're re representing children, the eyes are more like more so midway, you know, and so the forehead is a little more than, you know, what they will grow into later. And so I had to take her adult phase and sort of surmise what she might have looked like as a child and everyone loved this and so I mailed it you know I shipped it because I do I don't do digital I, I do it as uh, paintings and um and then out of the blue another Gwendolyn Brooks book came out it was beautiful and it was pink and there were no Gwendolyn Brooks books before and so the publisher said oh my god there's no way that we can now have two Gwendolyn Brooks children's books and they both have pink covers um and so even though this had been done a year um prior to that one coming out um you know because I'd done the cover first um, you know, they mailed it back to me. And as you can see, there's still a little pink shimmering through those clouds. And so there's a quite a bit of research that goes into um, uh, illustrating for biography. Um, and you can't find everything on the internet. And so in this case, I had to locate her personal papers, which was at the University of Chicago or Illinois, rather, uh, Urbana-Champaign, you know, and so I, I walked into the, you know, temperature controlled, climate controlled room, you know, um, and wore the white gloves. And I pulled out pictures of her family that don't exist anywhere. And so, um, you know, I also had to, um, figure out that her mom was a piano teacher. So more than likely there was a piano in the house. So it wouldn't be 
a weird thing to place little Gwendolyn at the piano. And um, I was able to hang some of the family photos on the wall, you know. Um, and I also knew that her dad, you know, through some obscure writing, her dad um, gifted her with a red desk that I was able to sort of like bring into the scene as well, um, because her mom noticed really early on that she was dedicated to writing. And so this is her mom announcing, you're going to be the next Lady Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Again, um, I go into my scrap pile regularly for inspiration. And I found a nice uh, 40s ribbon motif and a floral. And then I painted it for her hat. And this is her sending her letters out into the world at the age of 11. She was published by the American um, Childhood Magazine. You know, again, a little peek here. Yeah, and sometimes I have to call on my imagination. I have to infer as opposed to, you know, give an exact account, you know. And so this is her stringing her words, you know, and I put them on a clothesline, you know, and some of the poems, her early poems had TikTok clocks and paper dolls. And so she wrote, she continued to write even throughout the Great Depression when, you um, People were hungry, you know, all over the country. You know, she just persisted because that's how we get good at anything. So finding her personal papers, I was able to locate her handwriting and to find a picture of her brother Raymond so that I could then represent him in, the, you know, this scene here where her dad is reading out of their collection of the Harvard classics. You know, he's an incredible or orator. Um, and it was like her most amazing pleasure to listen to her dad's booming voice. Sometimes I've got to um, draw a lot of people <laughs> or paint a lot of people. So I'll make some splashes on the page, you know, with uh, some textures perhaps, um, and then bring it in, you know? So it's like almost like predefining the, the palette and direction um, without the uh, distraction of the human bodies and what they might be doing. Um, and so I have her passing through um, the double Dutch line uh, because she was a misfit. You know, she just didn't fit in anywhere. You know, she's like very bookish, you know. And I just remember growing up, I was like awful at double Dutch, which is a very popular um, practice in urban centers, you know. And um, and so anytime I would turn, they'd say, no, 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 uh, send her away. Send Cosby away. She's double handed. And no one wants to be brandished as double handed. Meaning you're not turning alternately in time, you know. Um, yeah, what an insult. <laughs> and so I was able to locate a picture of her <laughs> husband, you know, um, which is great, you know. So uh, then I could represent them. Even if I wasn't showing him, I feel I felt like, you know, I'm doing him some justice, you know. And so because there was very little photo reference, you know, I had to read in one location that, you know, her aunts presented a tall, beautiful cake with fresh flowers and another reference that said, I purchased my wedding dress for $19 and it was red, you know, and that the wedding was held at her parents' home. And I knew they had the Harvard classics, their prized and treasured possession in the mahogany bookcase. So these are things I could bring in and feel like I'm telling truth to the story. Um, so um, this is her receiving a note from her publisher. And so my publisher said, oh my gosh, you know, it's like the toilet, you know, can you put her by the vanity? I'm like, well, you know, these were apartments in Chicago that were carved up during the great migration to make room for this um, population that could only exist within the certain bounds uh, of a mile or so radius. And so there was a ton of overcrowding. And so people lived in these very small units and shared the bathroom in the hallway with their neighbors. So you would find the naked light bulb and the toilet as opposed to the vanity. And so it's like how to do this justice and still have it be visually pleasing, you know, um, allowing for the grayness of that uh, scene and a little bit of... Um, little bit of texture. Again, pencil and then go to paint. This is me working out um, uh, a cover. Again, look how many um, ideas, you know, you just never want to get so um, 
thinking that you've got to be so precious about it. This is my great masterful idea. No, you want to look at it several different ways, you know, be willing to turn it over, you know, uh, come back to it if you need to and find another approach. This one's called Beauty Her Basket. Um, and then I did some of the logo type. I tend to do the titles of uh, my books and that's it painted. Um, and then sometimes, you know, a publisher will fall in love with a sketch, you know? And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so they decided they love this one. They took it into, you know, the meetings. Um, and then this is me color sketching it to kind of work out where I wanted to place uh, the tonalities, where I wanted to, the darks to go. Uh, sometimes it didn't work out. It doesn't work out for the title. So you've got to rethink that. Um, and so this is what I, I presented with some possible type uh, treatment um, that would need to be defined and uh, refined further. Um, and they said, no, this is not the same boy. <laughs> the expression of his face, the other boy, the corners of his mouth were turned just ever so, and he looks too young here. And so I had to go back and repaint it. And so that's free water. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've got to paint a pie. So I'll roll out some crust, you know. Did you do that for this brick? Yeah. You know, and like put it in a pan, you know, add some apples, you know, cut into strips, do a little lattice work and, um, and bake a pie because you don't want to just use reference that has existed somewhere else. Sometimes you want to just create your own reference, you know, and so that's... <laughs> Yes. That's their uh, front and back cover. Uh, this is the case cover inside uh, the book underneath the jacket. And uh, this was a moment that I found in her cookbooks, which read as memoir. And she said her favorite thing of all time was to follow her dad, you know, behind his um, his um plowing and that little narrow space that he had carved out, she would, you know, tiptoe through it, you know, um, just one foot in front of the other. And behind her would be the chickens biting these like newly unearthed worms, you know, and just a moment, you know, and I decided to use that for her, uh, her end papers. Um, but I didn't know anything about really farming. I grew up in the city and, um, and so, I mean, I've met some kids in Nebraska with like driving uh, tractors, you know, and they're doing all kinds of things on the farm. But I literally had to watch like a hundred hours of like plowing videos. Because <laughs> fortunately, there's still societies that, you know, will um, will compete, you know, for the best, you know, plow line or whatever have you. And like, you know, like rewinding, like what happens to the blade and where's the grass go on what side? You know, so this is some of um, Chef Edna, which we'll read from later. Um, this is our, that moment of grief. Uh, her entering into the big city, um, sewing. I, I love that she was a sewist, you know, and this like whole idea of home and what home uh, tasted like in her memory. You know, and of course, she was co-owner of this restaurant. And so we have Salvador Dali. We have um, Truman Capote at the entryway there, you know, asking for biscuits, you know. And Edna's reply were, was, there are no biscuits on the menu. <laughs> and so um, when I read a little bit more of Truman's um, memoir, I realized, oh, wow, it's like as a Southern person, it's like I could understand why he was asking for biscuits because it's like that was his taste of home. Yeah, so we had Gloria Vanderbilt and, you know, a whole host of things. We'll understand what this is when we read from the book. Um, but yeah, this is her listening to her cake. Um, yeah, and sometimes you do a ton of spots um, that just don't get used. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, it's not about your efforts, really. It's about what makes for the best for this particular book. You've got to be okay with that. Um, yeah, and so this is a little bit of process, you know, just throwing some paint down. And then, as you can see, you know, I've uh, sketched out like where I want her to be using some paint and then refine it a little further. Again, the roughness of this sketch and then um, a paint layer. 
And then I go in there. Sometimes, you know, I fall in love with what's happening, you know, as it's happening, even though this is not necessarily where I want to take it, um, you know, but I've got to be willing to paint over it. Uh, so this is a project I've been working on. And I'll run through these really quickly because I probably shouldn't even be showing them yet. <laughs> um, and it's called Brown Girl, Brown Girl. It's written by Leslie Honoré. Um, and it's coming out in 2025, I've learned. So um, I sent them uh, a uh, sort of a color sketch because I woke up in the morning, um, you know, pondering the night before what I wanted to do for the cover. Nothing came up. So I, I went to sleep and I woke up and I just saw these colors together. And I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, so I jotted them down really quickly, did a really rough sketch so no one can fall in love with it. <laughs> Again, a color sketch. No one's in love with this. You know, they're not taking this into the meetings to, you know, show this off proudly. Um, and sometimes it just gives me the freedom to paint. Um, and it turns out this is not the cover in the end. They they chose something else for the cover. Um, and so this last slide, I think, I just want to share uh, with you because I think anything that you attempt to do, you know, whether you're not good at it yet and you're kind of like plowing through to um to get your practice in and to find your way and learn your way it's like just bring in this one little ingredient if you can <laughs> which is love <laughs> oh, it's beautiful yeah so should we go into the shoe box claire Yes. Are you going to read in the shoe box? Yeah, oh, yeah, I think I will. Okay, okay. so let's do it. There we go. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Shall I go? <laughs> Edna Regina Lewis grew up on a farm. By the way, I, I have to say, um, shout out. This book is written by Melvina Noel. She's the yes. author of the book. Edna Regina Lewis grew up on a farm in Freetown, Virginia, a proud African-American community founded by her grandfather and two other freed slaves. On the farm, Edna chased chickens, milked cows, picked wild greens, gathered berries. Edna loved it all, especially cooking with her mama, Daisy. I'm wondering if there are any kids in the audience who enjoy cooking with their adults or doing whatever they can in the kitchen. Spring breakfasts with fresh fish shad. Yeah, she loved to also use the shad roe, which is the, the eggs of the shad fish. Soaked in salt water, rolled in seasoned cornmeal, fried in home rendered lard flavored with a slice of smoked pork shoulder. Summer garden vegetables, new cabbage, potatoes, butter beans, string beans, tomatoes, eggplant, and green corn, autumn harvest of root crops, peanuts, and sweet potatoes, cornfields. I hope you guys have had your breakfast. I know. <laughs> Winter fruit cakes, plum puddings, sugar cookies, and peanut brittle and making biscuits. Edna watched Mama Daisy so many times she could make them by heart. One, two, three cups of flour, a quarter's worth of baking powder, a dime's worth of salt. And that's how they measured everything, just by placing it on, on coins because they got the, the perfect proportion there. Lard and sweet milk, thanks to Bella, their cow. Mixing, kneading, rolling, flattening the dough. Using an upside down glass to press circles, perfect circles laid out in rows. Pushed into the oven, rising a mild high, hot and delicious biscuits, Southern style. And that that's her growing up, just learning and observing from her mom. And then Edna made cake. And how did she know her cake was done? Mama Daisy showed her how to hold her ear close to it and listen. A bubbling sound, back in the oven, a few minutes longer, 
until a quiet cake is done. <laughs> It's so funny when I'm in the schools, I'm asking the kids how they, you know, um, know their cake is done. And they always say like, uh, when it's brown, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then one kid said, when you press a finger on the top and it springs back a little bit, I'm like, yeah, that's a good way. And then, um, and then some kids say, what's a toothpick? Because when a toothpick comes oh, out yeah. clean. So I invite them now to listen to their cakes. <laughs> When Edna's father passed away, Mama Daisy and her six children had to manage grief and life. Edna had to work to help the family. When Edna was 15, she moved from Freetown to New York. And so I have her like stepping into the portal there because it really was a brand new world for her. She went to work ironing, cleaning, cooking, sending the money she earned back home. She did. She even supported her sister's endeavor um, to go to art school, you know, and paid for her sister's tuition. She was just really a help to her family. Then Edna's mother passed away, and Edna worked even harder to care for her five siblings, typing, answering phones, working as a seamstress, dressing department store windows. It wasn't long before she was sought after and making clothes for movie stars. Yeah, so she did a lot of um, dresses even for um, Richard Avedon's wife and a whole, uh, for Marilyn Monroe and a whole host of other people. She really was um, a really uh, skilled seamstress. Edna started making her own clothes too. Traditional African dresses, repeating shapes and patterns in bright, bold colors. She was so stunning, people stopped her in New York City streets to take her picture. But Edna missed Freetown family and friends. She longed for large gatherings and homemade meals, long white cloth tables covered with Southern food, warm fried chicken, thin slices of boiled Virginia ham, green beans cooked in pork stock, turnip greens picked that morning, potato salad with a boiled dressing, pickles, preserves, and yeast bread, minced meat, lemon meringue, and fried apples, coconut and black walnut cakes, watermelon and cantaloupe, drinking coffee out of bowls. And there we have it. <laughs> Pure, simple ingredients, plus lots of love, a dash of smile, a taste of home. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to do for them at the table, um, I just did a, a little color sketch. I'll just share that with you if I reach over here. Um, yeah, I did a little color sketch and I knew that I wanted um, this to be like one of the characters uh, represented, you know, in the book. And then I, I brought her in. Edna catered events and threw dinner parties for her new friends. Am I being really clumsy about how I'm holding this book? Probably. No, no, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Happy faces all around, clean plates, requests for seconds. What kind of food is this? They asked. Faster than gossip, word spread about Edna's delicious Southern meals. New Yorkers wanted more Freetown food. <laughs> oh yeah and so it's really interesting because a lot of um the cooking traditions that she um she uh gathered from her mom it turns out yeah you know, these were uh things that have been shared because uh thomas jefferson um you know uh a little before this had actually brought in a french chef to work in his home and so um, and Thomas Jefferson is from Virginia. So a lot of the how-to um, that actually entered the South um, happened by way of Paris. So, you know, 
it's like all of the the sharing that happens, you know, from um from culture to culture. Soon Edna became Chef Edna and co-owner of a restaurant on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, frying, roasting, stewing, and baking, roast chicken, filet mignon, fish, zucchini squash, green salad, chocolate souffle, and caramel cake. The restaurant was a smash. Edna peeped out from the kitchen to watch actors and editors, poets and playwrights, even a first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> enjoy her food. It reminded her of family dinners in Freetown. One diner would beg her to make biscuits. Another asked if she studied her craft in Paris. What was her secret? Edna just smiled. Her Paris was Freetown, the flavors of home passed down from one generation to the next. New York, for now, was Edna's home. Union Square Green Market, her farm. Strolling along the stalls, chatting with farmers, comparing flavors, selecting fresh fruit, vegetables, meat, and fish, fresh, seasonal, farm-to-table ingredients for Southern cooking. Now that I'm not in New York, I really do miss the Union Square Market. <laughs> it's certainly the place to be on Wednesday morning and Saturday mornings. Alone in her kitchen, Edna makes biscuits again. One, two, three cups of flour, a, dime, a quarter's worth of baking powder, a dime's worth of salt, and sweet milk, rather lard and sweet milk. They used to make their own lard. Mixing, kneading, rolling, she makes them all with heart. And then Edna makes cake. She slips the batter into the oven and waits. How does she know when it's done? <laughs> she holds it close, just like Mama Daisy showed her. And she listens. A quiet cake is done. <laughs> and that's the end there of our story. We have our author's note where she gives us a little bit of background. And she's been so wonderful to include um, some recipes that she's tailored. And this one is called Edna's Biscuits for Two or Three. You don't want to make a whole batch of, for example, you're living um, by yourself. You do that and you can try it out. And that's her no longer with the plow line, but rather the crosswalk of New York City. So thank you. Gorgeous book. And actually, I've got some wonderful comments already for you, Cosby. Oh, great. So both, um, well, Melinda from Norfolk in Virginia. And oh, Edna wow. From um, Belfast in Maine. Uh, they both are saying what beautiful, well, the presentation was amazing and beautiful. And the book is exquisite and just love all your books. So okay. everyone's enjoying. I've got some more uh, Cornelies also uh, commented how beautiful thank you so much uh, good morning to you all and we're going to do a little bit of drawing and we might run over just a little bit because there was so much to enjoy with Cosby this morning oh wow she could have done an hour and a half I'm sorry oh, no. <laughs> not enough time <laughs> sorry. You, but let's I know and and now we have to take a moment to try uh, the camera. And so there will be a shadow. So I apologize for that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, we'll yeah. Okay. Let's see what we can do here again. Thank you. Yeah, I'll let you get set up and then I'll ask you some questions. Sure. Um, <laughs> or you can even ask me as I set up. It's all good. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I, I had some thoughts about your um, background with your clothes making, it, it, was that something you also learned from a family member? Was your mother a sewer? So I, I tell my mother, well, you taught me how to sew. And, and she goes, well, not like that, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, I don't know. You, it, it, so, child, you did some sorry? sewing as a child, I imagine. Yeah. So I just love. Did you sew um, 
Yeah, so I did sew a lot as a child and embroidered and hand crocheted and did a lot of handwork. And I've always had like this like thing for detail, you know, um, yeah. and so it just made sense. And I love um, solving these like three dimensional uh, problems using, you know, just like, you know, flat material, you know. And so that's um, something that I absolutely love to do. Yeah, um, it's a okay. talent pattern cut and all that <laughs> and that's obviously you know your dolls have such exquisite clothes oh my gosh oh. how long does it take you to make a doll like one of the ones that has all of the beading and the oh it, it depends you know some of the dolls um you know I'll, I'll work on them slowly while I'm working on other things you know yeah. so it varies depending on you know what I'm attempting to do with the doll okay yeah. let's see Okay. Yes, that's a good, yeah, that makes sense. Um, is this helpful? I, I feel like, oh my God, I didn't want yes. to take all of our valuable time trying to work this out, you know? Um, so I covered yeah, my little, okay. yeah, my desk surface. Um, and I love, you know, because I, I used to complain that I'm now working in a shoebox after always having a little more room. Um, but you know what? It's like so many of us find ourselves with perhaps having to even share the kitchen table. Yes, you absolutely. Know? And so don't let that be an impediment to creating, you know, like um, how much space you might have. So does everyone have paper? Um, so tell me who's out there. Do, uh, what are you working with today? If you brought some um, art supplies, do you have like maybe paints? Because I'm going to be working with a little bit of paint today. Um, yes, so or, everyone can work with whatever materials you have. You can uh, so if you have crayons. So why don't you tell us in the chat what you're what you're working yeah. with. Yeah, you can work. Yeah. So this assignment, quote unquote, <laughs> it's really kind of almost like a fun game. Like if you could have anyone um, past or present even at your dinner table um, sharing a meal, um, who would be there? Oh, uh, that's yeah. yeah, question number one. It's like, who would be there? You know, like I'd love to have my grandfather because my grandfather had so many stories um, and a lot of them were told in Spanish. So I feel like I missed them. <laughs> so I'd love to call him back and, you know, get him at the table again. Um, so that's what I'm thinking. So like, who would be at your table? I'm curious to know. Yeah. Um. Is this a distraction, the fact that I'm seeing um, a little bit of the previous presentation, Claire? Uh, it's, it's, um, it is a bit odd that it's there, but I think um. we'll, we'll still see the white paper. So let's see, <laughs> <laughs> let's see some color. Come. So we have Malvina Noel here. Yay. Hey. Oh, I love your book. What an amazing book. And what an amazing woman. To oh, write. oh, oh, Malvina. Oh, fantastic. Hi, Malvina. Yes, and she's going to use some watercolors and doing it abstractly. And we have oh, God. Okay, great. Good. Yeah, and, and so I say do this an abstraction if you if you um so uh, choose and please you know by all means. So one thing you can do um with your paper, for example, um so don't worry about your drawing skills. I say you could do something very simple like a you know a line across your center you know, uh, throw it out a little bit into perspective. And there's your table, right? We could give it a little bit of width, right? You can place some chairs there. How many people would you have here? Um, I probably should have shortened this a little bit <laughs> so I could have somebody on the ends of my table. And then here put some more people in there. See how I'm doing it like very sort of like, not so carefully, just a little box, you know? And then like head and shoulders, you know? So here's a head and shoulders. You know, like you could just even just like, yeah. See how simple I'm being about it? Almost like um, an abstraction. And here, here we have somebody else at the table. Head and shoulders. And then we can assign them actual identities, but you don't even have to represent that. Um, so 
so carefully, you know, maybe it's the essence of that person. You know, maybe there's a particular color that they, that they love to wear, you know, that reminds you of them. So can you see that guys? And so I've done it um, with a white pencil here, <laughs> you know, the big table. And I've got um, folks just sitting around the table. Um, and then what you could even do if you want to, rather than show the entire table, you may decide, for example, that you just want to show a cross section of some of the people interacting at the table, you know. Um, and then for the purposes of this demonstration, I've just picked just a handful of people there. I don't know if you can see that clearly. Um, so talk back and let me know if you can see that clearly. Yes, in the and then Melissa says, Cosby, your illustrations are truly captivating. Your unique style adds a special touch to each piece. It is such an incredible talent. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thanks, Melissa. Oh, thank you. Thank you your, uh, thank you for your beautiful Couldn't agree more. <laughs> ah, yeah. So are these fabric or drawings? These are drawings you've done. Well, so what I did is I took regular um, copy paper. <laughs> yes. And um, you could do this with crayons. You could do it with paint, you know, where you just start applying color to your page. And then that's something you can borrow, you know, um, you know, you can borrow it, you know, these little bits of textures, you know, yeah. so like, feel free. Or maybe it's like just, um, you know, bold swaths of color, you know, so all of these I just, you know, painted last night, you know, just to bring the <laughs> colors in. You know, wow. and then, yeah, and then the addition of black, or you can use construction paper, but you don't have to take the color of the construction paper as it shows up. You can mm -hmm. um, you can add color to it if you want, or texture. You know, right. to try to you how do you want to do that? This so so exciting because we we have to come. Have you come to the Society of Illustrators and do it in person? <laughs> oh, I, I so would good. love to. Um, so I think I want to put her in yellow. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. So I'm just going to um, cut out a little shape here, right? And, um, you know, as fate would have it, um, I went in to look for my glue sticks this morning and I noticed that they were dry. Um, and it's not the end of the world. If you don't have the materials that you had planned, you know, on using, just use what you have and like get into the habit of making use of what you have and be okay with it. Yes. You'll get something else, but that something else is okay. That's, that's how you get creative, right? Cause yeah, we, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did find a little um, bit of Elmer's, which is something I wouldn't necessarily be using. Yeah. Elmer's oh. is a bit more, you have to use maybe a brush with it, right? Or, or just even a, um, a, a little down rather than to go create, you know, <laughs> I'm applying <laughs> here, but like yeah. very thinly, yeah. I'm not overdoing it. You know, because I don't necessarily want to wet the paper. Um, and then I just drop her in and she's she's got this. This is so fun to see you do this. Wow. And everybody, I, I, Tim has agreed we can go over. So please stay with us and see because um, we finished this little piece because it'll be well, very inspiring for you. <laughs> yeah. And I even if I don't get to finish, you know, it's like. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, it might no, take no, a bit more time. <laughs> well, you know, it, even if I don't get to finish, um, I think. Um, I'm hoping that you're, you know, just using whatever materials you have and, um, you know, doing a little something and stop waiting for the perfect moment. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know, advice, it's like yeah. if you've got to clear off a, an edge of a table, it's like clear off an edge of a table and just go in there and play and, and don't be afraid to, um, you know, like even like, oh, I shouldn't even start this because I'm not going to have time to finish. I think it's okay to start even, like to do a little something. So this is a little too similar to that. So I may change this um, or maybe I'll just give them a different color. How about this? So I have a question, Cosby. Did you yes. and Sabina get to meet each other whilst the book was being created? No, as a matter of fact, no. No. yeah, we yeah, we didn't even um 
communicate, I believe, until the book was out. Yeah, right. Um, and that's fairly typical, I have to yes. say. Um, but, it's not unusual. Yeah, mm -hmm. historically, um, I don't know if that's uh, necessarily true with uh, Cameron Kids, but historically, um, illustrators and authors uh, don't really get to talk to each other. <laughs> um, yes. And, and, and the reason, way you could address yeah. the reason because it's something interesting, I think. Yeah, so um, it used to be that the thinking was um, because it's really the author's baby, you know, and it's it's kind of hard to release a baby. <laughs> and so um, maybe what might have happened in the past, and that's where this came about, is that the author would sort of insert a little bit, you know, what they wanted to see. And it almost like robbed uh, the project of the process of seeing how another person could envision it. Because the thing about once you hear something, it's hard to unhear it. Yes, you know? that's true. That's true. Yeah, and so so that's my thinking um, is that um, the power of suggestion sometimes can be so strong that we, <clears throat> you know, that we um, sort of don't allow what could show up if we allow somebody to imagine and to, to think about it. Right. So I've just put down two bold shapes, mm -hmm. you know, it gives me a little bit of um, sort of like room to not fuss over it, you know? And yeah. the beauty of um, cut and paste, like I once had a wonderful design professor who would say, when you're designing, it's better to cut and paste and not to draw. Again, you know, it's like we become so attached to what our precious little hands have done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not afraid to move things around. Um, so I, you know, it's like feel free to layer things, you know, um, as you saw with my, um, you know, my process demonstration, it's like, I'm not afraid to paint over things even. Um, yes. Yeah, it's like, just feel free. Could um, you um, push your piece of paper up a little bit? Because just up, a, yeah. Yeah, that's that's great because um, there's a little bit of um, like it's strange, but it's got your photo page. That's it. Okay. And um, Maya Jackson is asking. Um, she was wondering a good question. Who are the people that you're drawing at your table? <laughs> good question. Um, okay, so um, I we recently celebrated my mom's 84th birthday, and oh. um, at the last minute, my dear cousin uh, Dixon. Uh, came and I was so happy that he came because he really enjoys um, food <laughs> and so he's a little portly you know oh. um, yeah and so Dixon has to be at the table you know he just has to be there <laughs> um, and yeah if I could get my grandfather in there that'd be great but I'm not representing everybody that's at the table for the sake of the uh, demonstration right. yeah yeah, and so, yeah, and so I'm just kind of just putting in little um, shapes, you know, like um, just to give you some idea. Yeah, it really gives you a whole idea now, everybody, as to how Cosby goes about, you know, illustrating these pages in, in the book. Um, well, and so here's the thing, right? Um, so normally I paint, yes. you know, I yes. paint. And so that's why I wanted to do this exercise as a little bit of collage because it's Saturday morning. <laughs> and if you're going to do something for fun, <laughs> I think it's just always good practice to not necessarily do the thing you do, <laughs> but, uh, yes. okay. you know, just do it a little differently, you know, have a little fun with it. Um, yeah, and don't worry about it being beautiful as you're working uh, with it. Just it's important to have fun. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's also important to understand that oftentimes things would uh, will go through what I call the ugly uh, stage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and and don't get into the habit of judging things as you're as you're doing it to say this is good or this isn't any good. Just you know. Forget yourself for a moment. <laughs> That's a good, good tip. <laughs> yeah, just be willing to forget yourself for a moment.
So um, we had this um, image at the museum uh, in our show, and you work larger than the actual printed book. Um, I do. Yeah, yeah, and it looks really wonderful. And when you see the artwork in person, and it yes, it's it's all painted. Um, that's a good point. I was sort of got lost in the idea that you were collaging, but you didn't really collage in this book, did you? No, no, no right. not at all. I, I didn't use collage for this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Do you sometimes use that method in any of your books, or are they all like? Um, so there are some books that I've actually um, I've I've done some sewing and embroidering and stitching. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, that little heart that's in the background there, um, I hand stitched for a book called Most Love in All the World. Yeah. Uh, and so I brought in some of the textiles mm -hmm. for that. Um, but I'd love to do more of it, you know, um, to play with it a little bit, um, you know, for some upcoming projects. I said yeah. that looks like a little helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take away a little bit of the edge there and taper. So I hope you're joining me. Yes, with whatever I hope everyone's happy. Um, and even if you're thinking of what you're doing as sort of like some shorthand notes um, for something that you're going to um, come back to. Yes. Yeah. Everything that we do um, as visual artists, um, it's, it's almost, a, it's an outgrowth of the things that we love and what we enjoy. And so even if you're out fishing, if that's the thing that you love and enjoy, then that that somehow or another, you're going to find a way to bring that into your your art. So I just say, um, be you, <laughs> because that's what makes um, all of what we do so unique. It was a pleasure to have you this, this morning, and um, we look forward to the books that you're creating for the future. And check out um, Chef Edna. It's a fantastic book. Um, and you can check out on uh, Cosby's website. She's got many more books that she's done. They're all beautiful and award-winning books too. So, and this one is honored. It was in the OA show for 2023 and it's going to the Bologna Book Fair. So yeah. And, uh, oh, I, let me see what people are saying just quickly. Oh, thank you so much. This was wonderful from Cynthia. Um, and thank you, uh, yeah, Melvino, of course. Thank you for joining us. That was a real treat to have uh, our author with us this morning as well. Um, so take care, everybody. Until next month. Bye. Great one. So much. Bye. -bye.